We've all heard from scientists and social media influencers that you need to have a morning routine. I would say this is the fundamental step of any good morning. And if you don't do this enough, you are messing yourself up in a number of ways. The fundamentals that haven't changed. You know, I, I think I've sh shared with you before, the first thing I do every single morning. In this video, I'm going to share with you my own evidence-based morning routine. And I'll also look if some of the more common morning routine practices actually have any scientific evidence. My morning routine doesn't take hours. It actually takes less than 30 minutes. You'll also hear commentary from Dr. Greg Potter, who has a PhD in circadian rhythms, nutrition, and metabolism from the University of Leeds. What you do first First thing in the morning can influence the function of your body's clock, which in turn is going to affect your performance over the rest of the day. The early bird guts the worm. We've all heard that before. But is it actually true? Here are the main chronotypes and sleep wake on the cycles people have. The morning type. These people tend to wake up naturally before 6 a.m. and go to bed before 10 p.m. The evening type. These people tend to wake up naturally after 8 a.m. and go to bed after midnight. And lastly, there's the intermediate chronotype. These people are in the middle of the other two categories. And at one extreme, there are entire families of people with identified genetic mutations that cause very early sleep-wake timing. And these people have something called familial advanced sleep phase syndrome. At the other extreme, there are people with genes that contribute to very late sleep-wake timing. And these people have familial delayed sleep phase syndrome. So genetics clearly play a role here. I personally am somewhere between a morning type and an intermediate type. I do wake up early, but not that early. I usually wake up around 6 to 7 a.m. and go to bed at 9.30 to 10 p.m. I feel my body works the most optimally doing so, and I'm also more productive. But what does the science say about the health effects of these different chronotypes? Generally, morningness is associated with better health outcomes and a lower risk of chronic diseases, whereas evening is associated with worse health and a small but significantly higher risk of mortality. However, this is often thought to be mediated by the observation that evening people tend to follow unhealthier lifestyle practices. They're less physically active, they have worse diets, they tend to smoke and drink more alcohol than morning people. A less healthy lifestyle in general tends to both delay people's bodies' clocks and contribute to poor health. For example, less daytime light exposure and physical activity, more nighttime light exposure, greater consumption of caffeine and other stimulants can all delay the body's clock and sleep. Now that this is out of the way, the first and probably the most important thing I think everyone should do after waking up is get exposed to bright lights. Morning daylight exposure helps to align your body's clocks with the outside world and reduces the time it takes to fall asleep at night. Exposure to light can shift your body's clock and bright, short wavelength, rich light, like sunlight, can do this most effectively. That's why I expose myself to some bright lights within 30 minutes of waking up, ideally by going outside. Even at dawn and dusk, the intensity of light is around 20 times higher than the intensity of typical indoor lighting. And on a sunny day at solar noon, the intensity can be over 200 times higher. If it's dark, then you still want to get some sort of a bright light cue. That's where the bright light or seasonal affective disorder lamps come in Handy. These lamps have awakening effects, boosting mood and alertness. Another key part of my morning routine is red light therapy, which I usually do together with the bright lights. Red light therapy, which is also called photobiomodulation, involves shining red lights between 600 to 700 nanometers or infrared light 700 to 1200 nanometers onto your body. There's a lot of research about the benefits of red light therapy. It improves cognition, mood and eyesight. Red light therapy promotes collagen synthesis in the skin and increases the the production of other compounds key to skin elasticity, such as elastin and hyaluronic acid. A 2023 study saw that three months of photobiomodulation showed reversal in visible signs of skin aging. Related to this, red light therapy has been seen to speed wound repair. I do 10 minutes of red light therapy on my entire body. Although red light generally isn't harmful to your eyes, you don't want to look directly at the light because it's still very bright. There's a lot of gimmicky red light therapy devices out there that don't have the specific wavelengths of light shown in research to have benefits. The brand of red light devices with the right wavelengths of light that I use is Bond Charge. They have amazing small handheld and large full body red light therapy devices with both regular red light and infrared light. Bond Charge also has infrared sauna blankets which are very convenient and easy to use to mimic the longevity benefits of the sauna. Infrared light is very beneficial for the skin and the joints. Head over to bondcharge.com 
com forward slash seamland and use the code seam for a 15% discount. By this point, I'm only 15 minutes into my morning routine. I try to keep my morning routine as short as possible so I can start writing and doing other cognitively demanding tasks. I reserve the first three to four hours after waking up to writing. It's found that people tend to have better cognitive performance in the earlier parts of the day. Evening people, however, have it in the second half of the day. That's why I like working immediately after waking up because I'm a morning person. There have been experiments showing that circadian misalignment, for example, by giving people unusual light dark cycles, impairs various dimensions of cognition, including attention and working memory. And so it's really important to give your body regular time cues if you want to maximize your brain function during the day. During my workday, I still get exposed to bright daylight as much as possible. Daytime light exposure is associated with better mood. I also have big windows in my office. Working in windowless environments has been seen to reduce the health scores, well-being and sleep quality of office workers. Workers with windows get more light exposure and show a trend towards greater physical activity and longer sleep duration. Exercise is also a very powerful circadian phase shifter. Exercising in the morning helps to shift people's circadian rhythm earlier, whereas exercising in the evening tends to shift it later. Entrainment of the circadian clock with well-timed exercise has been seen to improve cardiovascular disease risk factors, such as blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, and body weight. If you exercise shortly after waking, you'll tend to accelerate your clock, pulling your sleep earlier, Whereas if you exercise in the evening, you'll tend to delay your clock, pushing your sleep later. I don't usually exercise in the morning because that's the time I'm dedicating to work. However, I still think it's beneficial to move your body in some way after waking up. That's why I have a walking treadmill desk. I can work on the computer at the same time as walking. Many people might find this counters their ability to focus, but I've gotten used to it and it doesn't distract me at all. I also spend many hours in front of the computer, so doing it all while sitting would be quite bad for my health. A 2023 meta-analysis of 23 randomized controlled trials showed that using standing workstations, sit-stand workstations, or treadmill workstations are effective in reducing sedentary time for office workers. So getting a regular standing desk or something like that could be very beneficial for your health, especially if you work in front of a computer. One of the most common morning routines people do is jumping into an ice bath. If you just br I brush my teeth every day, do you? Twice a day? Yeah, well, get in the fucking cold. Just do it. Alright, I'll start going Just ice. do it. It's three minutes. <laughs> First off, there are a lot of suggested benefits to cold water immersion, such as decreased inflammation, improved alertness and mood, enhanced blood sugar regulation, and increased energy expenditure through shivering. I do take a cold shower every morning. It's a great way to wake up and increase my alertness. On cold water immersion, there is the so-called cold shock response, which is characterized by a large increase in activity in the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, and hence an increase in cortisol in the blood. And since cortisol can affects the clocks in many tissues by acting on its receptors, it's plausible that cold water immersion could affect some of your body's clocks. However, cold can also have some negative side effects. Hypothermia still remains one of the leading causes of death among older individuals. A potential risk of cold water exposure is cardiorespiratory problems due to the cold shock from entering the water. Too much cold can also cause freezing and non-freezing injuries. For this reason, people with cardiovascular issues or the elderly people should be careful with cold exposure. Bear in mind though that blocks in your cardiovascular system make your cardiovascular system more vulnerable in the morning and this is one of the reasons why heart attacks tend to occur at that time of day. So if you have any sort of cardiovascular issues, then cold water immersion immediately on waking might not be for you. After the cold shower, I make myself some tea. Green tea consumption is inversely associated with all cause and cardiovascular disease mortality. Up to five cups of green tea a day has been associated with a significantly lower risk of all cause mortality. I drink about three cups of tea per day from various sources, such as green tea, chamomile tea, and ginger tea. I have my first coffee after my tea. Moderate coffee consumption is linked to a reduced risk of many diseases such as colorectal cancer, liver cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. A 2022 study found that decaf, ground, and even instant coffee all had benefits on reducing the risk of all-cause mortality and heart disease compared to non-drinkers. The lowest risk of death 
was minus 27% seen with two to three cups of ground coffee a day. I usually stick to two cups of coffee a day. Nowadays, there are some very influential people who say that you should wait at least 90 minutes after waking before consuming any caffeine. And I completely disagree with this. And I think if you want to consume caffeine within a few minutes of waking up, it's absolutely fine to go ahead and enjoy your caffeine. One is that the later that you consume caffeine, the more likely it is to worsen your sleep. And you have to bear in mind that there are people that metabolize caffeine very slowly. For example, for some people, it's half-life, so the amount of time that it takes for your body's concentration of caffeine in the blood to come down to 50% of its peak is over 24 hours. You see this, for example, in people with certain liver disorders. And so for these people, it's really important to have it as early as possible. So after my bright lights, my radiotherapy, my cold shower, I'm drinking tea and working on the computer. That's pretty much the end of my morning routine. And it takes me only 20 to 30 minutes. I don't do any visualization or affirmation exercises. They might work for some people, but I'm already very motivated and focused as a person. For me, the most important thing is to wake up and get to work. I know many people also have breakfast as part of their morning routine. I haven't had regular breakfast for the last eight to 10 years because I do intermittent fasting. This contradicts my morning chronotype, but I like it because I feel that it helps me to to focus better. However, epidemiological studies consistently find that skipping breakfast is associated with a higher risk of diabetes, all-cause and cardiovascular disease mortality. A 2019 meta-analysis of prospective studies found that skipping breakfast was associated with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes, but this association was mediated primarily by BMI. These observational studies are often confounded by the healthy user bias, meaning that people who skip breakfast usually have less healthy lifestyles in general. If you are otherwise healthy and physically active, active, like me who literally walks on a treadmill after waking up, then you probably don't have anything to worry about skipping breakfast, increasing your risk of diabetes or something like that. You just have to make sure that you don't overeat later in the day. Controlling for other factors, your body's clock primes you to effectively digest and metabolize foods in the biological morning. And responses to meals, including swings in blood sugar, tend to be better when the meals are consumed in the biological morning than in the biological evening. There you go, here's my evidence-based morning routine. It takes me about 20 to 30 minutes every day and I'm in my most focused productive state already. Technically, I don't need any of these morning routines because I'm already pretty motivated and eager to start working, but there are some things that I think are so important that everyone should do them such as bright light exposure. If you want to try out the bond charge real light therapy, then check out the link in the description. You can find me on the YouTube channel at Greg Potter PhD, and I use the same handle for my social media, including my Instagram. The name of my podcast is Reason and Wellbeing. And if you liked this, then I think you might like the episodes on chronobiology and cold water immersion. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. Thanks for watching this video. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.